Ian Duncan Smith resigned from the cabinet earlier this year. A prominent Leave campaigner joins us now. Well, good morning to you. How would you uh, summarise just the, this moment of history we are seeing this morning? Well, you're right. This is a huge moment. It's a moment for the United Kingdom, and it's also a moment for the European Union, in a sense. I mean, 24 years ago, I opposed the Maastricht Treaty here in Parliament, almost my first act. And I made the point that the reason I opposed it was because I believed if this and other subsequent treaties went through, it would take away so much of Britain's ability to rule itself that very soon there would come the decision as to whether Britain could stay in the European Union any longer. Uh, and I wasn't for leaving at that stage, but it's exactly what happened went on. More and more power was taken away. And finally, we've had this vote, and the British people have decided that they want to leave the European Union, and it is the job and the responsibility, therefore, of the government to deliver on that. But as you say, it is an enormous decision, but it's a decision, I believe, which, with the risks, but also come great opportunities for Britain uh, to be able to showcase it itself, to be able to strike new trade deals, and to be able to ensure uh, that dealing for, of, with issues that come down the tracks for British people can be more flexible okay. and lighter on its feet. Let me ask you this. The pound, I'm reading here, has now fallen so far this morning since this news that the UK is no longer the world's fifth biggest economy. That's quite an achievement by the yeah. Leave campaign, if that is correct. Yes, but of course you're going to see volatility like this in the short term because, you know, hugely the markets had bet massively on there being a vote to remain you know so what you saw was the pound rising what you saw was people transferring money into stocks on the basis that somehow uh, they would get a great deal after the vote took place and be able to take some profit off it the reality has been they made a major decision and they made a major error and they've been selling ever since but okay. the market will stabilize that is exactly what the bank but, but, of england said hang on again. hang on there's no logical reason really why, given we're facing several years of massive uncertainty and instability, why those markets should stabilize and why they shouldn't, frankly, carry on tanking. This is the very Armageddon scenario which George Osborne painted for us happening in real time. And we just have to trust that you guys know what you're doing. Is that trust, is that trust something we should be giving you? Yes, this is a democratic choice of British people. And our job now as a government uh, is to ensure that, therefore, with the Governor of the Bank of England, uh, that we remind the markets fundamentally that the structure of the British economy has not changed in any way. He talked about monetary policy being very strong. He talked about employment strategy being delivering the greatest number of jobs still in the European Union. And also, you know, we have a whole issue about growth in the UK economy is one of the best, if not the best, in within the European Union and in the Western world. So, you know, these fundamentals of the British economy have not changed at all. And, you know, for the moment, we continue to trade and cooperate and go on with the European Union. What is now about to take place is there needs to be discussions very quickly and then to put in place a twin track plan. Okay. One is for what domestic legislation needs to be brought through to amend the 72 Act. And the second element is to how that process of discussion with the European Union about what our future relationship looks like will take place. These should not take a huge length of time. In fact, they can be done reasonably quickly. And we're that just, is what the government needs to do right now. We're just about to go over to um, the city. Uh, just, just a quick, you know, we've, we've asked people to say just in a couple of words. I mean, just this morning, as against that backdrop of the financial markets in that kind of chaos, are you 100% optimistic this morning? I am indeed, because I believe that this decision, with all risks, some huge opportunities. And the opportunity for the UK now is to tear itself free from what is a terribly, terribly bureaucratic and top-led organization through bureaucracy, and to become much lighter on its feet to deal with those challenges ahead with a strong economy, which it has, and ability to set those trade deals. In fact, I was in uh, Washington uh, four or five weeks ago, and all of those senators and, and congressmen said to me, the moment you take a decision to leave should be the moment we start trade negotiations, and they should end very quickly. OK. okay. In Duncan Smith, thank you very much. Just Donald, just Donald Trump has arrived in uh, Turnbury. I might just ask you, actually, in Duncan Smith, this. Uh, Donald Trump has just arrived in Turnbury. What does this victory say for global politics, for the rise of populist po non-politicians, if you like, people mm. like Nigel Farage, not conventional politicians, Donald Trump and others? What does it say about an angry electorate simply not prepared to put up with conventional politics anymore? 
Well, I think it's very important for politicians like myself to actually listen to the electorate. Democracy demands that you recognize uh, what their concerns are. And what came out during the course of this, <coughs> this uh, debate and uh, eventual vote was that there were many people in the UK that felt that this, uh, the whole process post the 2008 crash had not been even-handed in the sense that those who had been responsible had gone on to do well and they, many of them in poorer circumstances, had borne that cost. And secondly, they had not been listened to over the issues of the free movement and, and migration here, which had forced their wages down in many cases. And they thought mainstream politicians weren't listening. The majority, vast majority of European nationals that live and work in Britain claim very little, if nothing, work very hard and pay their taxes, and indeed 50,000 of them work within our National Health Service. There's also, of course, the question of the million British people that live within the European Union, how they feel about